This is South Africa, a country with rich historical, cultural, and social diversity. Her nation is known as the Rainbow Nation, which encompasses a variety of cultures, languages, and religions. South Africa has a population of approximately 57.7 million inhabitants. South Africa's history is complex due to colonization and apartheid, Yet the implications thereof is still evident in the present era due to the gap between the rich and privileged and the poor and marginalized. This gap is racialized. It is prominent in areas like the Western Cape where many people who were evicted from its white neighboring areas like Strand and Somerset West during the apartheid era still lacks development in relation to social and economic issues. The critical question is, how does the health care function in this widespread inequality? Chapter 1 South African Healthcare System. So, the South African healthcare system is, uh, relatively speaking, a new healthcare system. We are dealing with a country that's relatively new. I'm actually older than the country itself, so I was born in 1987. We achieved democracy in 1994. We had the old apartheid South African state, which was obviously uh, minority controlled by a government of Afrikaans and English people, where African people or any non-white people did not have the right to vote. Along with that, socioeconomically, they have obviously been far more disadvantaged than the minority white population. After 1994, what, what replaced the inequalities between races was then inequality between income groups, which is still by and large preserved amongst the races. So I often say that the South African healthcare system is is comprised of three parts. The one is the public sector that caters for the majority of the population, around about 75 to 80% of the population. And then there's a private sector, uh, which caters largely to the insured population. That's about 18%. And we know that figure. And then the third system is of traditional healing. They may ask the traditional healer, why did I get ill? After they've been discharged from hospital. And primary health care in this country is free. Everyone who attends a clinic visit, anyone who gives birth, um, anyone who receives treatment for a chronic disease, that's very common, uh, will not pay for their treatment at a clinic or a maternity unit. And so that's, a, that's actually a, a big advantage of our system. If you have access to private funding, you can afford a medical aid, you can buy your way into a private hospital, you can see a specialist uh, without waiting. So some people characterize it as the health system for the rich and the other health system for the poor. The uh, private healthcare system uses more than half of the health expenditure for less than 20% of the population. So it's hugely unequal. There's a maldistribution of resources. And most of those resources are human resources. So they are the doctors and the specialists. The dentists, for example. 97% of the dentists are in the private sector. If you went to any primary care facility, you'd find literally hundreds of people waiting for, uh, for a consultation without appointments. So people queue the whole day just to get their monthly uh, medication. In the private sector, um, your waiting times are generally shorter because there are less people accessing services. There may be more time devoted to quality type uh, endeavors. Private hospitals, because they are run as businesses, they are generally cleaner, 
which is quite sad. There's no reason for public hospitals to not be clean. But there are those. The, the, the general perception is that private hospitals offer better quality care, but that's not always true. We definitely know that people earn more money in private and medication costs more in private. Uh, whether or not that's appropriate is a different story. You can get the same medication in public and private and pay 10 times more in private. The apartheid state purposely separated populations of people. And the, the, the story was that it was separate development, but equal. Um, uh, and sort of in practice, there's no such thing. Uh, where we are now in Cape Town, uh, we're, in, we're in the southern suburbs of Cape Town, which is close to the city center. Uh, and a long time ago, non-white people who were living in the city center were moved out into what is called the Cape Flats now. And so you dislocate communities of people, you affect their social determinants of health. You've pulled cultures away, uh, you've uprooted families, uh, you've taken away livelihoods. And so it stands to reason that any of those communities and their descendants will feel those effects for a long time. So there is an ultimate lack of resources and people are dying, people have excess morbidity because of that. But there's also a mismatch. So where we have resources, but we're not able to use them efficiently and to use them for the right people. Chapter two, the barriers we face. In South Africa, we have what's been described as a quadruple burden of disease. It's related to the four major categories of diseases plaguing us as a system. The first being infectious diseases. Uh, we've got a well-known burden of HIV. We now have a, a treatment program and, and millions of people on that. But obviously with a treatment program, our prevalence rates don't necessarily go down. Our mortality has decreased to, due to HIV, but our prevalence of HIV is still around 20% thereabouts. TB um, generally moves with HIV. It sort of, it, it feeds on immunocompromise. We have high rates of TB, about half a million people still get TB every year. And uh, the increasing problem we're seeing now is drug-resistant TB, uh, which is a major problem uh, for, for public health. And what has happened in South Africa, again, because of antiretrovirals, is that we've stopped, pretty much stopped the transmission of HIV from mothers to children. So that's been very successful. It's now below 0.5% transmission rate. So we're no longer getting children infected, uh, born with HIV. The second category is non-communicable diseases. Currently, 50% of people are dying due to non-communicable diseases. What we broadly call lifestyle diseases that are related to bad diets and lack of exercise, etc. Smoking to a certain degree. Incidents uh, in a society like South Africa, which is somewhere between a developing country and a developed country, uh, they call it the so-called transitional society. So in many transitional societies across the world, you get this uh, rising level of diseases that are more frequently seen in developed countries. And then the third one is trauma and violence, the third epidemic, if you want. Clinics and hospitals are overrun with violence at the end of the month and people get paid. And there are also obviously problems with alcohol and illegal substances, which increase our burden of uh, violence and injuries. I think we should be doing much, much more to prevent road traffic crashes and, uh, and interpersonal violence. And the fourth one is, is to do with uh, maternal and child health. Even though our GDP has us as an upper middle income country, we have uh, maternal and child mortality rates worse than some lower middle income countries. Unfortunately, South Africa is a water scarce country as it is. And the Western Cape, where we are currently now, um, is coming out of the midst of the worst drought in the last hundred years. I know it's gone around the world. We would have been the first city in the modern world to run out of drinkable water. Our dam levels were at 20%, but thankfully our rains have come back this year. We remain a water scarce country and uh, we have crumbling infrastructure. That water is undrinkable and much of the country will suffer from, first of all, drought, uh, and secondly, uh, inefficiencies in management of our water and sanitation systems. Both sectors, both parts of the, of the health, health system are struggling 
in South Africa. Dealing with all of those as major, as it were, epidemics at the same time is a huge uh, combined burden on the, on the health system. And our patients come from all across the spectrum, the social spectrum, from rural, from urban, uh, to Hrutskir because it's such a, a referral center. So Hrutskir uh, Hospital is uh, built in the 1920s or 30s. Um, this, where we're sitting now, is part of what used to be an old ward, in fact, a TB ward, which is really interesting because there were no TB drugs in the 1930s. So all patients, if patients had uh, TB, what they got was uh, rest, bed rest, and good nutrition, and sunlight. So their beds would be wheeled out onto the veranda there, and they'd lie in the sun during the day, get some vitamin D, <laughs> and they took their chances. But it's always had a very uh, high level, high quality of care. It's a tertiary referral hospital, so all the big um, surgeries are done here, the complicated surgeries and the super specialties are based here. Chapter 3. Changing the way we help. Shoko is a not-for-profit, community-centred, student-run organisation. Shoko stands for the Student Health and Welfare Centres Organisation. and. Shoko has two sectors, that's Shoko Education and Shoko Health. And we run health and education programs, including clinics and after-school teaching around under-resourced communities in Cape Town. Shoko was founded in 1943 by a medical student from UCT. He was struggling to fund his studies and he started doing extra work on an ambulance. And the ambulance took him into areas that he hadn't been into before and he saw the absolute need of people who really didn't have access to, to health services. Um, he then got some doctors involved and some funding and started taking students into the communities to offer free health clinics in the evenings. And from there, it just grew. So in terms of the services that we offer, Shoko caters to under-resourced communities that because they work during the day, so it's easier for them to go to a clinic in the evening or they don't live near a health clinic. Um, or perhaps the services that are offered in the clinics are not what they need and there's not enough time to be seen. Um, so then we go in and see them. But Shoko also caters in many ways to our students who benefit a lot from going in and getting patient experience, um, learning how to see patients and how to provide holistic treatment. Shoko is active in many different locations. It's mostly around Cape Town Metropole uh, within our sort of informal settlements or under-resourced areas and that's our weekly clinics. And then we also have women's health clinics, which are monthly, and they operate out of a ward in the hospital, where we've partnered with an organization that brings a lot of women that are displaced or refugees in South Africa, and they come for women's health-specific services. So this includes contraception and pap smears, as well as mental health, and then, of course, all the general medical complaints as well. The function of the volunteers in Shoko, the volunteers really keep Shoko going. So every year we have between 700 and 800 volunteers in the health sector. So the students are the ones that actually see the patients and then they present them to volunteer doctors, who are people that are already qualified that give up one night a week or every few weeks to come and supervise. My name's Taryn and I'm a fourth year UCT medical student, but I'm also head of international students on the Shoko Health Committee. So basically I'm responsible for overseeing all international volunteers um, who come and volunteer at our clinics. It's my role to just welcome them into our committee, provide them with a brief uh, overview, orientation of some sorts, to make sure that they are familiar with how things run on clinics and basically best prepare them and inform them of what they can expect. We believe that international students benefit so much from the Shoko Health experience in that they really get the opportunity to branch out into the townships, really experience how the vast majority of South Africans live and the challenges that they face um, with regard to accessing clinics and medication. So it's really a great opportunity for internationals also to put their um, clinical training into practice because often we find, or from my experience, I found that international students, yes, they learn the theory, but they're not very prepared when it comes to actually engaging with patients. They have limited um, exposure back home. So it's the perfect opportunity to 
to put what they learn into practice. So often I've found from my experience that international students or just people that aren't familiar with the South African context um, lack an understanding of how to engage with our patients and understand our patient profiles and backgrounds. And sometimes they grow a little bit frustrated when um, posed with um, you know, barriers such as the language barriers. Um, so sometimes that can be a bit tricky. Um, however, I do my best as head of internationals to just prepare the students for all those kind of situations and ensure that they pair up perhaps with the UCT student who's more familiar with our context to prevent any um, misunderstandings from arising. I think that the Shulko model of healthcare is, from what we've found from our own research, it's quite unique. And we haven't really found a lot of universities overseas that offer a similar, similar sort of structure that's student run and goes into communities and you know, offers services where there's a need for them. And I think that there's so much potential for that. And I would really like to encourage people at other universities to look at starting a similar thing. We might not all have the same health needs, but students are an amazing resource. Everyone is so driven and so passionate about helping others. And there's always good work to be done. Chapter four, an optimistic future. We have the plan for a national health insurance, which is the broad idea is to bring these two uh, parts of the health system together. The national health insurance idea is about uh, redistributing the funds, but they need the quality of care in the health facilities and in the health services needs to be improved up to the same acceptable level. So we can't have one standard for the rich and another standard for the poor. You have to have one acceptable level of health healthcare. Uh, and it's absolutely possible I visit Brazil and I see that it's possible in a nation that's four times as, as large. And so I don't see why it's not achievable here. Along with that, we also need to address the social determinants of health. And, and that's, that, that's actually harder to do than, than, than achieving universal health coverage because it talks to socioeconomic development of people. It talks to improving employment, reducing inequality, making sure that everyone has access to food and water making sure we fundamentally change the nature of our economy. Our economy was built for 10% of the population. How do we actually grow our economy? And at the same time, redistribute what needs to be redistributed to people who were previously disadvantaged. There are tensions inherent in that. People have been disadvantaged. People are angry and they want change. That's a difficult thing for people to give up what they have, as it were. So it doesn't happen easily. This is just a reflection into some of the prominent and critical problems that the healthcare system in South Africa is facing. Of course, this reflection does not do just to the realities and lived experiences of those who are deeply impacted by the healthcare system or the lack thereof. Although there are many complexities to the system, actions are being taken to address and readdress these prominent issues. We can only be active agents in confronting, exposing, and eradicating the inequalities that the country is facing, which directly impacts the healthcare system. So we propose that radical transformation begins by constantly questioning and addressing and readdressing these problems. This will allow us to rethink the ways in which we deliver services and perform particular duties. It is our responsibility to ourselves, to each other, to the community, society, and the country at large to take radical action for the problems that we create for ourselves. We can only hope that structures and forms of inequality will one day be called history. Let us live and strive for freedom.